Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I want to welcome you all. Uh, don't be uh, deterred by the jets sailing by, the presidential helicopters. It's all part of Washington, D.C. life. Um, you've probably had a chance to catch a glimpse of this exhibit, Coal Plus Ice. Uh, the idea of it is that if it's difficult sometimes to get to people by way of words, images perhaps are uh, a secondary way. So we hope you will enjoy it. We hope you will bring your friends. Uh, it is kind of a nice uh, 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 thing to take children to as well. Now, as part of this six weeks of being here at the Kennedy Center during the, their 50th anniversary, uh, we're having events on this stage. And the conceit is to bring people like you uh, who might not otherwise come here into the tent, literally uh, like a carnival barker. So here we are. And tonight we have a, a wonderful event uh, that is a collaboration with uh, Georgetown University. Uh, we have four students uh, from there who are going to be speaking with uh, former Vice President Al Gore across the generation gap about climate change. It will be moderated uh, by my friend and colleague, Laura Tyson. Uh, and uh, uh, they will have a chance to interact with each other and ask each other questions. Uh, the water on the floor, look at it this way. Uh, we do live in a world where nature still prevails, and that is exactly the challenge of climate change. So look at it metaphorically, uh, if you will. All right, uh, Al, Laura, and our four students, uh, while I come up, let me introduce you uh, to the students. Um, we have Anya Wahal, uh, who has been majoring in, at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. We have Maya Sahulga Smith, uh, who is also in the Foreign Service School of uh, Sciences of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Carson Ramirez, a sophomore, a student working in Georgetown's Native American Student Council. And then we have Erfan uh, Namazada, who came out uh, from, Australia, uh, from uh, Afghanistan just in September. So join me in welcoming uh, Al Gore, Laura Tyson, and our four students. Would our students also uh, please come up wherever you are? Here, there ah, you there are. There they are. All right. Yes. Right. So hello, I'm Laura Tyson. I'm the moderator, but I hope that means I don't have many oh, words to see. say because oh, we have such an outstanding uh, panel here. I think what I'll do is just do a couple of questions that are a little bit stage setting. Um, and I'll be just sort of start, we can see pictures of where we are, but where we are. And I know that Vice President Gore uh, was uh, in Glasgow. And I know that uh, a very large number of countries now, the last count I have is 74, maybe 75 now, are committed to net zero by 2050. And a growing number of companies, 3,000 by my last count, committed to net zero. But I want to start with why net zero? What does, what, what, why does that matter? Where did that come from? And, and I should say, um, I just, you all know this probably, but I really will underscore here that Vice President Gore was, has been a visionary here. And he's always been a vision guided by science, by science. And so part of this net zero comes from science and what we can live with on Earth. So let me turn to you and net zero. Where are we today? Well, thank you very much, Laura, and welcome, everyone. It's such a privilege to be with all of you and uh, especially these four students. We had a chance to visit uh, earlier before coming out here. And thank you all for coming. 
Uh, Laura and I were colleagues uh, in the White House for, for many years and have remained close friends all these years. So net zero means uh, no additional net increases to the overburden of greenhouse gas pollution in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Uh, and why net zero? Well, uh, it's the first law of holes when you're in a hole, stop digging. Um, <laughs> but there are other reasons as well. First, to paint a quick picture of this, uh, we're surrounded by beautiful pictures, so you'll have to make do with a word picture here. Uh, the Earth is surrounded by a very thin shell of atmosphere. And when I say thin, some of you may have seen images from space where the sun is rising from behind the earth and you see a very thin blue line around the, the planet. That's where the greenhouse gases are. If you go above that blue line, uh, you can't breathe unassisted anymore and all the greenhouse gas pollution is below you. How thick is that blue line? If you could drive a car at interstate highway speeds straight up in the air, you would get to the top of that blue line in a little over five minutes. Wow. It's extremely thin. Mm -hmm. And we're using it as an open sewer. Mm -hmm. Free of charge. You got some global warming pollution you want to get rid of? Just dump it into the atmosphere. No charge. Uh, just go ahead. And that's what we're doing. Every day, mm -hmm. worldwide, we're putting another 162 million tons of man-made heat-trapping pollution into that thin shell. And the accumulated amount, it, it builds up over time. Uh, the math is actually very complicated and above my pay grade, but the scientists have uh, told me that it's scientifically accurate to say that on average, each molecule stays about 100 years. Now, it's built up and the cumulative amount now traps as much extra heat in the Earth system every day as would be released by 600,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every 24 hours. And it is radically changing the ecology of our planet. It's disrupting the water cycle, evaporating much more water vapor off the oceans, atmospheric rivers become atmospheric tsunamis, we get these rain bombs. It's also pulling moisture out of the soil so the droughts take hold more quickly. In California now, it's the driest beginning of the year since records have been kept. Mm -hmm. uh, six of the seven hottest, worst fires in California history has, have been in, in the last six years, uh, uh, last seven years. Uh, and we're seeing tropical diseases moving poleward. Uh, we're seeing the ice melting. Three days ago in East Antarctica, it was 70 degrees above normal. In multiple recent years in the, at the North Pole, it's been up to 50 degrees uh, higher than normal. So the ice is melting, and we're a coastal species in the main. So massive disruptions uh, are, are in store. Uh, it's hurting crop yields because the crops we depend upon were developed in a, in a cooler time, uh, and it's hard for them to adapt. And, and of course, these storms are wreaking havoc all over the world. Every night on the TV news is like a nature hike through the book of Revelation. But here's the other thing about net zero, Laura. Mm -hmm. In the latest IPCC report, which mm -hmm. was a dire warning, right. nevertheless, there was some good news. Mm -hmm. it's, it told us that if we can reach net zero, the temperatures on Earth will stop going up, stop going up. with a lag of as little as three to five years. Mm -hmm. And if we can stay at net zero, half, 50 percent of all the man-made CO2 will fall out of the atmosphere in as little as 25 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. So we can solve this, but we still rely on fossil fuels for 80 percent of the world's energy. We can replace it. Uh, solar and wind is the cheapest electricity in the world. EVs are fun to drive and they're getting cheaper and within two years every model category is going to be cheaper in the electric than the combustion version. Uh, and there are other good news stories, but I'll end with this. The, the fossil fuel industry has a, a degree of control over political decision making and policy making in many countries around the world and they are blocking any of the sensible steps we should be taking 
to get off of burning fossil fuels and toward a safe pathway to the future. So it's the, the good news from that report, um, but also the, the evidence is that right now we're not on the net zero trajectory we need to be on. So net zero is a 2050 goal. We got, and if we do that, we get this, we get to a sustainable, uh, we limit the temperature increase to a sustainable amount. Okay, and then we can do these wonderful things that reverse. But we're not currently on that trajectory. And I, want to, I think we should, and this will probably be part of our conversation going on, why not? What makes it so difficult? So you mentioned the, the political influence of the industry, but clearly our whole transportation systems that we build, our buildings that we build, our whole agricultural systems that we've built around the world, they were built on a carbon energy model. So all of those things need to be changed. Yeah, an astonishing amount needs to change. Uh, again, the good news, we're in the early stages of a sustainability revolution, powered in part by new digital technologies, uh, machine learning and, the art of, and artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, even blockchain, also in biotech. Executive teams are getting the ability to manipulate electrons and protons and atoms and molecules and proteins and genes with the same proficiency that the IT companies have demonstrated in managing bits. Uh, it, it has the scale of the industrial revolution and the speed of the digital revolution. Great. But there are forces trying to hold it back. Uh, last year, 2021, if you look at all of the new electricity generation installed in the world last year, 90% of it was solar and wind. Uh, all of the EVs are getting so much cheaper. We're seeing uh, regenerative agriculture and sustainable forestry growing in the use and popularity uh, by farmers and foresters around the world. But we need policy changes. We have everything we need uh, except political will, and that's growing. Uh, the, the, you're an economist, Laura, and you know well, you've forgotten more than I'll ever learn, about concepts like the, the time value of money. Mm -hmm. There's also the time value of carbon. Carbon reductions early on are more important and more valuable yes. than carbon reductions later mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. partly because they linger up there. But in order to reach net zero by 2050, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, tells us we have to cut emissions in half by 2030. And that's okay. just eight years from now. 2030. So we need a massive commitment to undergo this big transition. And there are many pledges, the good, that's good, but thus far, months after Glasgow, there's been very little follow-up on a lot of those pledges. So how can we change that? Well, I'm here to talk to you about it, but I'm also here to recruit you. We need help. <laughs> right. People need to be politically active. It's important to change the light bulbs, but it's more important to change the laws and policies. And elected officials need to hear from you. So a final question, I think we'll get right into the politics, is basically the notion of a just transition. So not just an orderly or a speedy or a scale transition, but a transition that is just. And a number of the, a number of the changes that need to occur may have disproportionate burden on poorer populations in poorer countries. So basically, I, I guess what I want to know is if we, if we say in California, so we do everything we can to sort of uh, basically uh, promote electric vehicles. And, and we do that. And, and, and we set the standards for the country and all that. But the point is that that is not by itself going to affect what happens. I saw this, the, the images over there. China developing rapidly. India developing rapidly. China developing rapidly and dependent upon coal. India development rapidly and depending on coal. How do we... <sighs> 
what policies, what mechanisms, what financing do we do to make sure that the transition does not fall disproportionately or without financing on the poorest populations in the poorest countries, or even in a, in a country that's not that poor anymore, but still rapidly developing China? Yeah, yeah, and even in this country, I agree with you, the transition has to be a just transition. Uh, and, and the good news here is that uh, the Oxford Policy Review, among others, just found that uh, a dollar spent on the renewable energy transition mm -hmm. creates three times as many jobs mm -hmm. as a dollar spent on expanding the fossil fuel okay. uh, economy. Mm -hmm. These projects uh, have to be planned with justice in mind. But here's a crucial point, Laura. The fossil fuel economy is itself uh, in unjust. Okay. Climate justice points, mm -hmm. the advocates point out that poor and marginalized communities, mm -hmm. including people of color, are far more likely yes. to live downwind from the smokestacks and downstream right. from the hazardous mm -hmm. waste flows. Mm -hmm. They are disproportionately affected. A black child in America is 10 times more likely to die of asthma as a white child in America. Three times more likely to get uh, asthma. Uh, there are many other examples. Worldwide, how many people do you think are killed each year by the particulate co-pollution that comes from burning fossil fuels? Three times as many as died from COVID last year died from the air pollution from burning fossil fuels. Nine million people per year, disproportionately in those communities that are more likely to be downwind. I could give you lots and lots of examples. So transitioning to clean energy and electric vehicles is, <coughs> is, is itself a just mm -hmm. transition, but it has to be accomplished in a way that furthers the, the justice that is sought. And, and probably that means, in, in, and I think you, you know from your experience, one of the things where government policies have helped is where you do tax subsidies or tax credits. You, you accelerate the adoption of solar. You accelerate the adoption of wind. You accelerate the adoption of electric vehicles. I mean, that's what you do. And, and because you're trying to give people an incentive and the wherewithal to make that transition fast. A absolutely, a and <laughs> it, it is disgraceful that the fossil fuel industry has been using its political influence, its lobbying dollars, its campaign contributions to block <laughs> this transition. Right. Take electric vehicles. Their supporters in the United States Senate, 51 of them, are opposed to this transition, 50 Republicans and one Democrat. Uh, let me give you another example of how climate justice uh, affects uh, poor and communities and communities of color. One of the reasons why a lot of the so-called offsets have become controversial has to do with something that in majority communities people didn't think about. I'll give you an example. In southwest Memphis, a huge refinery that puts out air pollution, most of the pollution goes into a 97% black community. Okay, if that refinery says, okay, we're gonna adopt a net zero plan and we're gonna meet it by buying offsets, we're gonna trant please trees in Bolivia. Well, the people who are in that poor community who are still choking and dying, right. they have a 5X cancer rate in that community. And, and they go and say, stop this. And they say, oh no, we're planting trees in Bolivia. We're good, we're fine. <laughs> well, that is climate injustice. climate injustice. And it's one of many reasons why the offsets uh, need to be carefully scrutinized and yes. not used as a get out of jail free card. Okay, look, I'm gonna, I've, I've, I've started some, the conversation, but the students have lots of questions and I see them nodding away. So I am just gonna turn over here and uh, I don't know, why don't we just start it at, at that end with Maya? Um, Did they give you a handheld mic? No, we'll send a mic down. Yes, we can share this mic. Thank you. Oh, no, it's appeared. Yeah. We, we, Leave it to me. We can share this. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. Is, is it on? So Good this evening, is Maya. Everyone. Maya? Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, you've shared a lot. Uh, you spoke about injustice. You spoke about the net goals. 
What I want to know is, from your perspective, right, what is something your generations, the policy people who are currently sitting in positions of leadership, are willing to hand over to the youth to ensure that these goals are met? In other words, what role are our generations meant to serve in securing our future, your granddaughter's future, your granddaughter's grandchildren's future? Yeah, um, I have a granddaughter uh, at, at, at Georgetown. We were talking earlier. So um, one of the famous civil rights uh, organator, uh, organizers once said in the 60s, uh, nothing important is obtained without a demand. So when you say, what is uh, the generation of older people in power now going to give your generation, what are you going to demand be given? And I say that not to shift the burden to you, but in recognition of the way our political system operates. Our democracy is broken badly. In order to solve the climate crisis, we're going to have to pay attention to the democracy crisis. Big money has way more influence in our democracy than it should. Corporations have been designated as people and given the right to anonymously contribute as much dark money as they want uh, in, in political campaigns. This is not right and it's not what our founders intended. But the way it can be overcome is with what used to be called people power. Now, we are hardwired as human beings to react immediately to dangers like snakes or other humans with clubs or the kinds of things that our ancient ancestors survived. But we also have the capacity to use our reasoning facilities and our ability to communicate among ourselves to solve big problems that, that need to be thought through. We did it with the abolition of slavery, with the ending of apartheid, with the civil rights movement, with women's suffrage, more recently with the LGBTQ. You know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, if somebody had told me that gay marriage was going to be not only legal but celebrated and widely accepted all over the country, I would have said, well, I sure hope so, and I just don't think that's possible to see that much change so quickly. But it happened because, as with the other morally-based movements, when the underbrush was cleared away and the clear choice was revealed as between what's right and what's wrong, then the outcome became foreordained. Now pe people could... You know, if one of their neighbors is gay or lesbian, people care less who they fall in love with. It's their right. And that is now a widely understood moral principle. We have to get to that same place where the climate crisis is concerned. We cannot continue to use the sky as an open sewer in a way that is absolutely destroying the future until we stop filling it up with global warming pollution. And young people have always been in the vanguard of these morally based social movements demanding change. I'll come back to the fact that I'm, I want to recruit you, all of you. We need your help. We're behind. We're in the second half of the game. We're behind. We need to catch up. We have everything we need. The International Energy Agency says to, yep. to cut emissions in half by 2030. We've got everything we need with proven deployment models. And yet the fossil fuel industry keeps trying to convince us that, oh, we need to, we need to wait. We need to concentrate on these long range pie in the sky technological possibilities that might give us a magic solution. What they're trying to prevent is the immediate deployment of safe, clean alternatives now that are already cheaper because it hurts their business models. And I'm sorry if it hurts their business models, but I want my grandchildren and yours to live and thrive in a world that is, is not degraded and, and destroyed. And the IPCC tells us that's what's coming until and unless we act. I'm sorry to get all fired up here, but you press Yay, my button. <laughs> That's, that's fantastic. That, that, that was very mobilizing. And, and I, I just want to add one of the things that, that's implied there uh, is the link to the threat to democracy. Um, it does mean that I'm going to look out in the audience again. It is very, very important that young people vote 
and that they vote not just for national, not just for national elections, but for state elections, for local elections. State of California has a very aggressive climate policy, and that is because we have a governor and legislature very committed to that, okay? But you've got to vote as well. So you can, and look, I also think uh, marching on the streets uh, in favor of a, an issue is very, very important, and I suspect uh, that we may see some marching on the street by women uh, come the fall if the Supreme Court uh, undermines, undoes abortion rights. So I just want to say that this is also about political mobilization and about voting. So uh, let's, yes, let's go to Anya. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. So I think my question to you sort of extends um, in the sense that I think a lot of the times as young people, we constantly hear that your generation is my hope. Um, what? Is our hope from older generations. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think huh, I'm definitely one of those young people who is really energized around the climate crisis, but of course there's also younger people on the opposite side who maybe don't believe in climate change or don't agree about the urgency of the climate crisis. What would you say to those young people um, about the change that you hope to see in our well, lifetimes? Maybe they're watching Fox News in prime time or something. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, you, you remember the, uh, the woman... Uh, in Moscow who worked on state TV and during their most popular prime time newscast she walked out on the stage with that big sign you remember, did you see that just, yeah. and, and you know you're you're being lied to she said she did an interview afterwards and she talked about the zombification of Russians with propaganda so that they they live in this bubble you know well, there's a, there are forces trying to zombify Americans also. You know, uh, on, in, on social media, a lot of sites, you know what the rabbit holes are. And people get, go down these rabbit holes, more like pitcher plants, they can't get out. <clears throat> and at the bottom of the rabbit hole is the echo chamber. And when you stay in the echo chamber long enough, you become victim of a new kind of AI, not artificial intelligence, artificial insanity. And it's, I'm not kidding, They're, they deploy it with a, with a purpose. Voltaire once wrote that if you can get people to believe absurdities, you can convince them to commit atrocities. Yep. Uh, you saw that on January 6th. You see it with some who deny the science uh, and believe the earth is flat, or in the case of global warming, they believe the propaganda from the polluters that it's not that bad, it's not so, you know, it's not such a problem. This is a battle for truth. Mahatma Gandhi said the most powerful force for change in the world is, I'll, I'll mispronounce this, uh, Satyagraha, which I'm told translates into truth force. Uh, and all of those other morally based movements I referred to were powered by truth force. This is as well. The, the polls and the studies show that your generation, statistically, is way more likely to not only understand the climate crisis, but to be motivated to solve it. Why do you think your generation is more likely than mine to get it? I mean, I think it's because we see the change happening in our communities, and a lot of us are just angry. I think when I talk to older generations about climate change and they ask me how I feel, the answer like from all of the young people I know is angry and we're itching to act. Everyone I know who talks about climate change is itching to do something. And I think the anger and the frustration is that we do sometimes feel like the burden is shifted on us, but not only that is that we want to act and we're frustrated that we can't act now given the urgency of the situation. Yeah. And I think that is what really mobilizes us because we know that climate change affects us and we know that climate change affects our families, maybe not our grandparents as much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, let's just go. I, it's, I, I really want to point out one thing. I think that the, the polls are really important here, that you say that, this, that the younger generation feels it more. You used anger. It's also the case that they feel it more because it's happening. 
I mean, let, let's, you know, a, even a decade ago, there was much less sense on a day-to-day -day basis that it was happening. So people get, feel it, they see it, and then they get angry. And so, the, unfortunately, the, we are in climate change, and we are experiencing it, and it's going to be difficult to, what we want to do is kind of get to a pathway that's sustainable, but we can feel it and adapt right now. We have to adapt right now. So I think that's an important point that you raised, the evidence, the evidence. So um, how about turning to Carson? Good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to give a small preface before I actually give my question to you. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about how um, we should consider first how intertwined indigenous rights, indigenous people are within environmental impacts, such as with climate change, mm -hmm. oil spills and everything that affects land around us. I'd like to ask you, where do you exactly consider indigenous people within your work? Hmm. Qu quite a lot, actually. And thank you for making that point. Do you have uh, an indigenous heritage? I'm Quechua. Oh, well, OK. Well, thank you very much. The indigenous uh, tribes in North America have played a magnificent leadership role in the climate uh, movement. Uh, the, 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 the pipeline that, uh, that has been blocked in the, in the Northwest, indigenous people really led that charge. Uh, a coal export terminal around uh, Seattle, uh, and again, indigenous tribes played the leading role. There are many, many other examples. I, I do regular uh, trainings for uh, climate activists. I've trained 50,000 people personally in these uh, multi-day tr training sessions. A at all of them now, I have indigenous speakers uh, and have for quite a, a long time. Uh, we often start with a land acknowledgement, but beyond that, we uh, have in indigenous activists uh, who bring a a really different and really important perspective to this challenge. So thank you for the, asking the question. I, I get it, brother. I get it. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm with you. And I have learned from the tribes uh, of North America quite a bit. Thank you. Oh, oh look, I, 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 did you, did you, I, that was your, that was your question. Cause you, you had a, you, okay. Oh, I, did you have a question after the preface? Oh, that, <laughs> I thought you, were, you yes. said you were going to have a question, so yes. <laughs> and so, more so, what do you currently think about within the issues of, um, how do you say, I'm not sure if you heard about it, but there was currently an oil spill. There was previously an oil spill by Peru and Ecuador. Where? where? By Peru and Ecuador. Oh, Ecuador. yes. Ecuador. Can you tell us a little bit more about what do you think about the situation and what do you think you could have helped to do? Well, it, the companies that have responsibility for that uh, should, should pay for it. I don't know the legal details, but as a general principle, that should be the case. And if you look uh, across South America, particularly uh, in Amazonia, uh, not only Brazil, but Peru and uh, Bolivia and the other countries that make up part of the Amazon, there have been a large number of indigenous environmental activists who have been murdered uh, just just in the past year and in the last se several years because of the drive to exploit their traditional lands, clear them off for soybean plantations or cattle uh, pastures or, or mining or, or oil drilling. Um, as a U.S. citizen, I don't have the right to influence laws in those countries, but all of us should demand justice for the in indigenous activists in, in that region. Uh, and this, this oil spill is the most recent of, of several that have taken place. It's taken place in Ecuador, in Colombia, of course, Venezuela, um, uh, as well as Brazil. Thank you. So, uh, Erfan, and let me just say, uh, just as a moment here, Erfan is a, re a very new immigrant to the United States from Afghanistan. Uh, and came in September of last year, uh, a high school student, uh, and uh, 
we really welcome him and his family and, uh, and all of the very difficult exit of Afghanistan, he and his family have experienced. So just, I just wanted to note that. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Al Algor. So I have a question. It's a personal question, <laughs> if you don't mind. Uh, as you look over back 15 years of fighting against the climate change, mm -hmm. is there anything that you would do differently? <laughs> and the second question is, what are the some thoughts that you have and you're suggesting to the uh, world leaders for preventing and to stop the more carbon emissions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been at this a, a long time, 45 years. Um, and you ask about the last 15 years, what would I, I'm not sure what I would do differently. You know, you learn and grow as you age, even, even at my age, you still learn and grow. <laughs> and you will go through a lot of learning and growing. I suppose there's some things I know now that I didn't understand as well 15 years ago, but that's the way life is. In terms of commitment and choices that I've made, I've been going all out for a long time. I'm not sure what I would change 15 years ago compared to now. Maybe speak louder, uh, I don't know. Uh, um, I have, uh, I'm working on something to measure and yeah. identify emissions precisely, but maybe we'll have a chance to get to that later. I would have started that sooner maybe if I'd known how to do it. Um, I am uh, really deeply concerned that American democracy, and I spent 24 years as, uh, in, in Washington, D.C. as an elected official. I'm really concerned that our, our democracy is, is failing to address this challenge. There are senators and members of the House of Representatives today that are as bright and informed and energetic and capable uh, as any that I ever served with in my time. The new group, the, there are so many great ones and they're trying really hard. But they're good people trapped in a bad system because as I said earlier, money has too much influence and the bar to make our democracy work is, is higher than it should be. We can still clear it if we have enough activism, if we have enough involvement, if those who are elected really begin to understand that their ability to continue in office will depend on whether or not they do what's necessary to solve this crisis. If I could go back and figure out any better way to ratchet up the pressure, I would do that. But I've been trying as hard as I know to try for quite a while now. And God bless your, your family. Uh, I'm so glad that you and your family made it here safely. And any other family members that may still be there are in my prayers. Yes. So I think you should actually talk about uh, what's called a climate erase or climate, your, 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 your climate trace. Climate so, trace. So you mentioned that. So this is a new project. Uh, we're combining I, I, the artificial intelligence, the digital age, the industrial age. The, uh, this is, I think, a really interesting new project that I think... Yeah, th to... thank you for... You, you mentioned you might uh, give me a chance to talk about it. Yeah. Climate Trace. Trace stands for Tracking Real-Time Atmospheric <laughs> Carbon Emissions. This is an independent coalition, multi, uh, international, mm -hmm. that is made up of high-tech, uh, artificial intelligence firms, uh, universities, and NGOs using data from 300 existing satellites that can see the smoke, the infrared sensors can see the heat, they can see the ripples of water in the cooling ponds, the cars in the parking lot. They combine that with information from more than 11,000 land, sea, and air-based sensors and multiple internet data streams to use artificial intelligence to precisely identify exactly where the global warming pollution is coming from. They can, the owners of these polluting facilities can disguise their ownership. We can see them from space. We got their GPS. We have their number. We have the emissions. We're not the climate cops, but we are like neighborhood watch with the watch. world as our neighborhood. 
We just published last September the first independent comprehensive global inventory of emissions. Every country in the world, more than 100 countries for which we haven't had any emissions data previously. And this October, we will, we will uh, publish the first asset level inventory with at least the 500 largest emitters in every subsector of the global economy in every country. And then one year later, we will have 100% of all the emitters. Uh, we, we have it now on a monthly basis. It will be weekly and then daily. And soon, in maybe two years, we will have it every six hours. Why, why do this? We've never had a, an inventory of where the pollution is coming from. You can see a big smokestack, but seeing every emitter all around the world will give investors a chance to set priorities if they want to get net zero in their portfolios, investing activities. It will give governments a chance, many of whom don't know where the pollution is now, a chance to begin shutting it down. It will give corporations that want to have net zero supply chains the ability to choose. It will give NGOs the ability to set priorities in their campaigning activities in, in order to, to go after strategies that will reduce emissions. Does that explain yes, it? Yes, yes, okay. yes. It's, a fa it's fascinating. You can go very, to very important. climatetrace.org. It's a nonprofit. Yes, Maya. Um, I do have a follow-up question about the trace technology that you all are developing. Does it account for productions of CO2 that one owns in someone else's backyard? A lot of times we talk about environmental displacement. You know, you talk about China as a, as a major global emitter of CO2, but they're producing our products. Right. So, like, how do, we, how do we determine who owns what in terms of the production? Even though it's happening in a location, how do we then trace truly who is a component and who is becoming, like, who actually yeah. is a part of it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, for, for all of these hundreds of thousands and then millions of sites, we will also have what they call metadata, what the technology is, who owns it, who is leasing it, and to your point, what they're making, because if, for example, there is a polluting facility in China that is making products that we buy here in the U.S., your point is perfectly valid. We have moved the... The, the, the factory function for many supply chains over to China and to other countries. So a, a justice in allocating responsibility for that pollution shouldn't fall, uh, uh, the responsibility shouldn't fall only on the facility that's making it, but the entire life cycle process. Uh, and, and so I, I agree with your point, but, but what we're doing is simply identifying exactly where the pollution is coming from, how much per hour, per day, et cetera. And then what happens to the products they make, that has to be sorted out in a separate process. So that the product thing is, gets me to a question I was going to ask you all. <laughs> and it's a little bit goes to your point. Uh, I think it was Maya who talked about anger. So I'm the older generation. Um, I raised my children, or my child, and, and he's raising my granddaughters. And I didn't think at the time that I was doing anything that you would be angry at. I was, uh, you, you had a lifestyle that involved where you lived, your transportation, the products you bought, the places you went to, all of them generated carbon. All of them generated carbon. It was not priced, so none of us, the parent or the child, nobody was paying attention to the carbon being thrown in the atmosphere. We were just, we weren't thinking about it. We didn't, we didn't have a price. We didn't have evidence that this was the result. And I think my question to you would be, okay, now you're gonna be the, the parent. How are you going, what, how do you think that will affect how you raise your children? Okay, what, 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 and what kinds of pricing mechanisms are, say, are you willing to pay 
for a product or service that will price the carbon that is being thrown into the atmosphere. So if you price it, it won't be thrown up so much anymore. Um, I do believe it was Anya who uh, shared that sentiment. Yes, Anya did. Yeah. I think, <laughs> I think when my emotional response to the climate issue makes me hungry. And, hungry. you know, I want to create this really great, delicious meal, and I want to mm -hmm. do it together. Okay. Um, and in terms of addressing your question, the type of future I envision is one that is priceless. You can't put a price on human creativity. You can't put a price on our planet. And I think that's what we need to move away from. When you talk about capital, you're talking about a system that was created that was never meant to value human bodies. When I envision a future of where I raise my children, I envision closed community systems that expand outwards, where everything you need is within the proximity of where you live. Okay. There can be vertical, vertical farming where you have lab-grown meats and vertical farmed vegetables and produce to supply you the food that you need. Okay. You can live in a building in which the energy is produced directly where you live on a block where solar panels and wind and water system managements do everything that needs to be done on a large, large scale for the millions and billions of people that live here on this country. Okay. Let's take all those systems and make them small to fit our exact communities okay. and then make it fit our exact community needs. Mm -hmm. And to Mr. Gore's point, the science is there. There is no more try. There is only do. There is no more denying. It, it snowed two Saturdays ago. Like, it's March. <laughs> it's here at our door. And so when I think about the world I want to raise children in, alongside my friends, alongside the people I love, I think about communities that are built sustainably on love. I hope that answers Wonderful. that. Wonderful. So, I, I, actually, I'd love to hear, so, uh, since it was also your question, Maya, from anger to, to love, or how, how do you vision uh, your generation taking over this challenge? Yeah, well, first of all, I really resonate with what Maya said. I think that was really beautifully put, and I couldn't agree more. I do think an answer to your question, for me, and I think for so many other young people, climate change is personal. Um, it mm -hmm. directly impacts us and we want to see the changes today, now. But that can't happen unless we're all willing to make individual sacrifices, individual changes every day. Mm -hmm. And like Mr. Gore said, of course those individual changes are important, but institutional and policy changes are important too and have the capacity to make wide-ranging solutions. I think that's why, for personally in my career, I'm hoping to dedicate my future to making those policy changes, but of course not everybody has that privilege. And so I think what I see for a future for climate change is hopefully a future that has equity. Because like you were saying with pricing, of course that pricing is very important, but not everybody can pay the price that is quote unquote needed for the, for the planet to go where we want it to go. Mm -hmm. um, I study water a lot at Georgetown, um, and my honors thesis is on the Arizona water crisis, actually, which is where I'm from. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about water and how there are all these international treaties and conventions saying that water is a human right. Everybody needs water to survive. Everybody needs it to live. But if you look at economics and finances, I'm not an economist, but I do know that water is not priced as what it quote unquote should. If Given, given the scarcity that we have, given the resource allocation that we have. But we look at it from a human rights perspective, it's opposite, because everyone needs water to live. So how do we look at these solutions from an equitable perspective? What I feel is what I hope to contribute to my future is to have these pricing be shifted on the people who can pay, people who are privileged who are willing to pay. On an international level, that's the United, the United States, who has contributed historically to emissions far more than a country, for example, like India or like Taiwan, who are developing countries and still maybe need some time to develop and to care for those citizens. So I think, when I think of my future, I think yes, individual choices, but also policy changes and also equity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I think, how about Carson and Irfan? What is, you're, you're the next generation. What, what's your notion of what you can do or what you would like to see policymakers do? 
Well, from my perspective, I think about my home already, where I am right now. I come from a very low income family. Okay. And so thankfully I'm at Georgetown. Hopefully I can get a better future for my future family. Mm -hmm. But I also think about the indigenous perspective. God, think about that perspective. This burden has been put onto indigenous communities. Indigenous communities really never brought this upon them. And it was just, you think about this and you think, wow, what do they, what do we do now to like not just help us with this burden that we've given upon us, mm -hmm. but this burden that we've given upon them for centuries, and not just to them, but to many marginalized communities. And when I approach this idea, I think that my best solution for this, or my best approach for this is mainly educating others, telling okay. others okay. what's happening. Because I know not many people are able to go out into a huge stage. Not many people are able or are even feel like they could go up to a huge stage. And all I suggest is go out and tell your friend, tell the person right next to you the news that you get on climate change. If there's something that's bugging you about climate change and you know a statistic that you can tell them, tell them about it. Don't feel scared that they'll shrug it off, that information will stay in their brain. Mm -hmm. And I found, out, I found that common amongst my other peers that if I tell them something, it'll stick with them. And who knows, maybe you can start a conversation with others. Maybe it ends up to someone such as even to you, Al Gore. <laughs> maybe my piece of information will end up to you and go on. Who knows where? Yeah, uh, let me respond to that. I, I think everybody's so well spoken. Um, <laughs> We have to win the conversation. Uh, and democracy uh, begins with conversations. And some people are reluctant to speak up about climate because there are some who fly into a rage if they hear the word. It, it, sometimes it is almost like the uh, classic <laughs> scene in a movie or play where there's a dysfunctional family with an alcoholic father and everybody else in the family is afraid to even mention the word alcohol because the father will fly into a rage. And so everybody tiptoes around the, you know, the so-called elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. And some people are timid about even bringing up climate, but we have to. And be kind. You don't have to be, you know, mean about it or listen and try to understand. But stand your ground and, and 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 try to convince people you can if you if you keep trying one other thing i wanted to say you were talking about pricing water it reminded me of one of the lessons i've learned from indigenous people uh your people are from south america in north america the standing rock sioux taught everyone the lesson that water is life water is life uh and Right now, I'll tell you a quick story, and I mentioned this uh, a black community in Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah. New, that refinery where they're getting the air pollution, mm -hmm. they just proposed a new high-pressure oil pipeline to carry oil from the Permian Basin in Texas through Memphis, snaked through a 97% black community over to another pipeline that goes down to New Orleans so they can export the oil right over the largest freshwater aquifer that a big city is dependent really? on, right through the, the so-called extraction zone. It is a reckless, racist ripoff. Why did they choose that pathway? They, the company spokesman said, well, we thought it was the path of least resistance. <laughs> this, is, this is how uh, disadvantaged communities have been taken advantage of for years. So we started a big a uh, set of demonstrations, and others did far more than me, but I drove my camper van to Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, we had a big rally and called the mayor, called the county government head, and eventually the entire uh, city of Memphis said, no, we don't want this pipeline, and it, was, and it was blocked. But then last week, the oil companies used their political influence to get the state legislature to... to start passing a new law that says from now on, no local community or county will have any say in fossil fuel infrastructure. 
If you're in a local community and you don't want a pipeline, you don't matter. Oil companies have convinced us to do what they want. So we're going to put it right through your community anyway. This happens all over the place. It is environmental injustice. It is racist. It is reckless. And it is a ripoff, particularly of your generation. Anyway, I, I got started there and <laughs> I, I, I have to tell I, you what was on hey, my mind. I, I'm just, I've been fighting I, I, this. I, I would go again to, to the point about uh, voting and yep. voting at the state level, because I have to say that there are governors in the in the United States who are absolutely it's it they they speak for those industries they represent those industries absolutely okay? and so you've got it you've got it got to change the state houses you have to change and the by the way so, under our current laws the burning of fossil fuel in the United States is subsidized. Yes, it is subsidized. 28 times this more <laughs> than the money that is given to speed up the deployment of renewable energy. Yes, that's, that's a very important point. So a very, very important point. That goes to the issue. So I'm, I'm the, the economist here. And I, I, I want to go back to the points about imagining the future, imagining a future without price, imagining, uh, designing whole new communities. Um, I was involved with a couple of big research projects trying to estimate the investment costs of the net zero transition. Okay, there are trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars around the world. We, we're talking a lot here about the United States, but basically there are gonna be trillions needed in China. I keep seeing the coal in China. Uh, I haven't seen any picture of India, but okay. These are huge amounts of investment. And by the way, the countries themselves cannot finance them. This is going to involve the private sector. The public sector cannot do this alone. We can put policies in place. And I think, I think one of the things we want to get from you guys is, okay, what's the policy you think a government should adopt? But the truth is there's going to have to be a lot of private sector engagement. It is not without price. It's not without cost. So I don't, I'd be interested in your notion of what the private sector can do here, because we, we tend here, we're, we're treating the private sector very much as villainous in a way, because there, there are real villains in the private sector, but we're gonna have to rely upon the private sector to help us out here. So, so. I, think, I think that's definitely one of like, an important consideration. When you talk about price, you talk about cost, you're really talking about wealth. And when you're going to trace CO2 emissions, you should also trace wealth. Um, trace it back 100 years ago when New York City was barely a million people big and they used to dump their trash on Ellis Island because they only had a million people. But look at it today. Okay. You can't dump your trash there anymore, right? So go back 200 years ago, trace the money. Okay. Where is the money now? And when you talk about cost and price, there are those who simply do not to Anya's point, have the privilege to pay the cost. Right. Their mm -hmm. costs look different. They their can't. prices are different. Their mm -hmm. needs are different. They cannot. Um, as an educator, one of the things we're doing in the classroom is you accommodate what you're teaching to fit your audience. To go back to Mr. Gore's point about you know, trigger words, you talk about language. How do you have conversations? How do you bridge connections across so many divides? Sometimes it takes understanding language, to figure out the cost together, to figure out the price together, to answer the question more concretely. <laughs> Envisioning the future, the cost, wealth is concentrated with very specific families and very specific industries and very specific people. But we are all sharing this world together. My question is, how do you convince people who don't really feel those impacts because they have the price they have the power to say the price. They have the power to determine the cost, to care, to care about the people, the countries who don't have what is necessary to create what is needed. Like, that's what I wonder about. Okay. Yeah, the, if I could res respond to that. One of the other big challenges we face in this country today and in the world as a whole is the rising levels of inequality in access to money, inequality in wealth, 
any inequality. For example, black families in America, it takes 11 and a half average, so-called average black families to make up the family wealth of one so-called average white family. And that's the legacy of generations of racism, uh, the legacy of the failure of Reconstruction or the cancellation of Reconstruction after the Civil War abolished slavery. Uh, it, it, it's a result of ongoing racism. Uh, and, you know, you, you can't put down everything to racism, but it is a, it, it's a pervasive presence, including in wealth. And where inequality is concerned, we are now reaching levels that can only be described as hyper inequality, where a, a, you know, a very small number of people have as much money as ha the bottom half of the world. And so when everything is priced, then that has implications. There's an old saying, I'm sure most of you have heard this uh, cliche, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. In the same way, if the only tool we have for measuring what is valuable is a price tag, then those things that come without a price tag attached to them begin to look as if they have no value. Clean air to breathe, clean water to drink, uh, fairness and, and justice. And so we have to balance the market system with democracy that is effective in providing public goods where education, environmental protection, assistance with child care, family leave, all things that are in Build Back Better that's been blocked uh, in the Congress. Mm -hmm. So we, I completely agree with Laura Tyson that the private sector and the market economy has to be a crucial part of making this transition. It's the only way to do it. Way. But right. we need reforms in the current version of capitalism in order to bring into play uh, the, the, the changes that need to be made. We need to stop subsidizing fossil fuels. The only reason we do that is that the polluters have so much money and political power that they get their, the people who do what they want in the Congress, the, you know, they, they say jump, and some of them in the Congress say, yes, sir, how high do you want me to jump? Uh, and we, we've got to change that again with, with people power. With people power. Yes. I have a question, sir. Yes. Uh, Please. You said inequality, right? So um, the question that I have is very simple. There are some countries, like developing countries, poor countries, like my country, Afghanistan, which is suffering from water pollution, air pollution, as Mr. Gore uh, pointed out, that annually, or maybe in back two years, we have lost nine million people, right? That's right. 20, 2000, uh, I'm sorry, 27,000 people just in one year we have lost in Afghanistan. Uh, you probably think that Afghanistan is, there is just war, there is just poverty. Larger than that, surprisingly, is climate change. Like, no. uh, climate, uh, air pollution is the obvious example. Water pollution, uh, Afghanistan is one, of the, is one of those countries which is the least responsible for carbon emissions, but most impacted by carbon yeah. emissions. Uh, there are some countries around us, the neighboring countries like China, like India, they're emitting carbon emissions, and carbon emissions are coming to our country. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question is, uh, you talked about the United States. How you're going to solve the problems uh, in poor countries, like yeah. my country, like African countries, right. and even India is, uh, is a yes. developing country or developed country, but, uh, but there is like 300 or 400 million people who are being impacted by poverty. Uh, their well-being is at risk. At, as, uh, and China, China, the population is like about 1 billion and 300 million people. Yeah. So 
uh, and the second largest economy in the world. But the people are at high risk. My capital, um, the city that I used to live there, Kabul, is, is a small city. And, but the population, is, the population in there is about 6 million people. We have more cars there, like with insufficient infrastructure, I mean, uh, with, with the fuels, with the oils, and the gasolines that we are using for our cars and for other, uh, uh, other supplies and tools. Uh, they're, I mean, they're making more uh, pollutions. So how are you gonna resolve <laughs> Yeah, well, problems? it is by definition a global crisis and the solutions have to be global mm -hmm. in nature. Mm -hmm. You're quite right that the, the poor countries, the low income countries are more affected by the climate crisis than those that have more resources to try to adjust and adapt. If we don't solve this, no country is gonna be able to adapt. But in Afghanistan, I followed this pretty closely and the climate related long run drought in Afghanistan has been utterly devastating. And of course, the tragedy of war and the tragedy of the Taliban, they just reversed, they broke their word yesterday and announced that no longer will girls be able to go to school in Afghanistan. This is medieval brutality and in, in, insanity. Uh, it, it's such a, a tragedy. And, and, but where the climate is concerned, the solution has to be global. And the wealthy developed countries have to bear the biggest burden, yep. have to take the lead, yep. have to reduce emissions, That's right. have to assist the low-income countries in making the transition, have to end the subsidies for fossil fuels, and have to rapidly deploy the, the new technologies here and uh, throughout the world. It sounds hard. It is hard. It is hard. But not doing it would be much harder still. So we have a responsibility to solve this crisis which is affecting your country. Uh, I want to make another point. So, as you said, uh, I've told this many times that individuals and policymakers, politicians, they've been told what should they do. Like an individual, like me, a common citizen, or other people that are sitting uh, in front of us. Everyone they can here. do like, they can recycle bags, plastic bags, the policymakers, the politician, like you, sir, you can promote or you can encourage car companies to, instead of using um, uh, coals and more, uh, yes. I mean, oil, gas, right. they, can, they can make electric cars like Tesla, Elon Musk. And so, another question <laughs> that I have, sir. We have the solutions. We are seeing the impacts. The impacts are flats droughts, uh, earthquakes. We know that uh, we are in the middle of crisis, a big crisis. So, uh, but how we are go gonna like resolve the, all the problems? I mean, the generally, the problems that we are facing. Uh, world powers, they're accusing each other. Like China is accusing United States. United States is accusing China or India accusing China, but what I ask, sir, is generally what all the countries, what the world powers can do to prevent and to stop climate change conflicts. Yeah, we, we have to have an, uh, a set of international agreements that are not just voluntary agreements, which is what we have now, but we, we, we need to really put some force behind these agreements. In order to do that, we really need a change in the political climate worldwide. And again, it sounds impossible. It's not impossible. Uh, it looked impossible from Nelson Mandela's prison cell on Robbins Island in South Africa during apartheid. And he once said, it's always impossible until it's done. Uh, there were people who felt despair in the abolition movement and the women's suffrage movement, uh, but it was done. How long will it take? I can't answer that question, but I feel that we are getting closer and closer to a political tipping point beyond which 
the majority of people in every country will begin to demand that their governments start reducing this uh, global warming pollution. Uh, I don't know any other way to do it. Uh, and the reason I train climate activists all around the world and work on projects like Climate Trace and work in the finance system to try to allocate more private capital to this transition uh, is be because there's no other way to do it that I, that I, that I know of. Um, and, and again, I say we all have to get involved. Uh, you, you know, you think back what you thought about global warming 10 years ago. You probably were way less concerned. You might not have even come to an event like this. But you've learned a lot in the last 10 years. And Mother Nature has taught us a lot yes. in the last 10 years with these tragedies. I'm telling you that if you read the IPCC report 10 years from now, it will be way different still. This is getting worse. It's getting worse. Half Half of all the pollution that is up there now has been put up in the last 25 years. And the amounts are still going up each year. This is insane. Uh, the great economist Herb Stein once said, if something can't go on, it won't. Well, we have to make sure that it won't. There was another economist, Rudy Dornbush, who mm -hmm. launched a famous law, Dornbush's Law, and here's what he said. Things take longer to happen than you think they will but then they happen faster, faster than you thought they could. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I believe that we are getting closer and closer to the political tipping point beyond which things will happen faster than we thought they could. And your generation, I'm not putting the burden on you, uh, but your generation mm -hmm. with Greta Thunberg and uh, uh, Vanessa Nakate and so many others uh, are actually out there firing people up I think this is the largest emergent social movement in the history of the world. It's just now getting started. But we need to move faster. We have everything we need, except, as I said before, political will. But remember this, political will is itself a renewable resource. Our job is to renew the political will to get this done. Wow. That, I want to make sure we don't have any other questions. That's a wonderful note to end on. I, I really want to underscore this notion, which I have heard, and it's just so mobilizing to all of us here. We have everything we need. We have the technologies. We have the ability to finance around the world. We've got to get the agreements, but we have the ability to do it. So what is the mobilizing to get the technology speeded up and to scale and financed is what you're saying, the political will, the emergent political will, and that's the younger generation that's going to make that happen. Is that, I think it's a fantastic message. Thank you very much. Let's all get it done. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much.